someone manufacture it here for uh, for us but we are think no facts been fulfilled Ich bin zurück in Philosophie. When's the last time you heard of a president writing to a philosopher on their birthday to tell them that they're one of the greatest Americans? On John Dewey's 90th birthday, President Truman did just that. Doesn't sound impressive? Well, his 70th and 80th birthdays were national celebrations, with parties, conferences, and news coverage. Prior to his death, Americans consistently rated him as one of the most eminent Americans. But reassuring is the man more responsible than anyone else for the school's new teaching tactics. America's number one educator and philosopher, John Dewey. In 1968, he was even commemorated on a stamp for the USPS. So why is he such a relatively unknown figure today? For example, in 1984, the American Psychological Association announced that Lillian Gilbreth was the first psychologist to have their face on a US postal stamp. They forgot that Dewey had a stamp and he was the eighth president of their organization. I think that there are a lot of reasons why Dewey isn't as well known today. And before anyone asks, he did not invent the Dewey Decimal System. That was Melville Dewey. Some of these reasons are political, some are social, and some are philosophical. Nevertheless, Dewey is a fascinating figure. One of the common themes in Dewey's writing, particularly his later writing, is that experience and culture are not really separate things. Now a statement like that is sure to inspire controversy, and specifying exactly what Dewey meant by that, and why he believed this is too complicated to address completely in one video. However, as a corollary of this thinking, Dewey often pointed out that philosophy was also shaped by, and was to some extent a reflection of culture. With this in mind, before we consider Dewey's philosophy, Let's consider the lived experience for those of his time. When Dewey was born, slavery was still legal, as the Civil War was still a year and a half away. If you had asked, who's the president of France? The answer would have been Emperor Napoleon III. If we look at a world map of 1859, we can see a world very different from our own. Just to the north of Vermont, Canada was a colony of Britain. Germany did not exist. Russia owned Alaska. And in the United States, much of the West was still being settled with Oregon just becoming a state. To give further perspective, in the year Dewey was born, Big Ben had just been completed. The first oil well was established in the US. A Tale of Two Cities was published. Ground was broken at the Suez Canal. And four days before Dewey's birth, John Brown led a raid in Virginia in an attempt to spark an armed slave rebellion. In science and academics, Dewey was born the same year that Mill published On Liberty. Marx published on political economy. Urbain Le Verrier, attempting to explain the peculiar orbit of Mercury, proposed the existence of the planet Vulcan an important episode for philosophers of science. And perhaps the most important for all of Dewey's work, 1859 was the year Darwin published on the origin of species. Contemporaries of Dewey's birth year include Kaiser Wilhelm II of Germany, Pierre Curie, Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, and philosopher Edmund Husserl. In 1856, John Dewey was born, and on January 17, 1859, he died. On October 20th of that year, his parents gave birth to a boy and named him John. Yeah, his parents named him after his older dead brother who had just died. One can imagine what that does to a kid. His parents were interesting figures. 
His father, Archibald Dewey, was a businessman and left soon after Dewey was born to fight in the Civil War for the North. After being discharged, he decided to remain in the South instead of returning to his family until 1867. So for the first several years of his life, Dewey did not really know his father. Unsurprisingly, Dewey's mother had a far more significant impact on him. Lucinda Dewey was born in 1830 in Vermont. This was during a period in America called the Second Great Awakening, a religious evangelical movement which stressed individual self-improvement and a personal relationship with God. It also sought to apply Christian thinking to social problems, ultimately dedicating itself to temperance, the abolition of slavery, and reforms to help social welfare. The movement inspired women to convert in higher numbers than men, and unsurprisingly, it was Lucinda who impressed on Dewey the importance of religion and a strong social conscience. Dewey was raised in Burlington, Vermont, during a time when it was expanding from a town to a city. Skipping several grades, he managed to finish high school at the age of 15 in 1875. He then entered the University of Vermont. During this time, he was partial to what was new and experimental as opposed to studying the classics. Dewey also began to develop an interest in psychology and philosophy, reading T.H. Huxley's Elements of Physiology. Vermont was host to its own philosophical school of thinking known as Vermont Transcendentalism, which opposed British empiricism and tried to reconcile science and religion by finding a rational justification for religious belief via rigorous introspection of what our minds are capable of knowing. His exposure to these ideas is important because Dewey's early work is dominated by idealist thinking. Once Dewey completed his undergraduate degree, he had a brief stint in teaching high school before he turned his mind back to philosophy. In a line of thought that would continue throughout his career, Dewey sought to undermine materialism in order to preserve room for human value. His first paper, entitled The Metaphysical Assumptions of Materialism, was submitted to the Journal of Speculative Philosophy. It was approved by the editor W.T. Harris with the recommendation that Dewey pursue a career in philosophy. In 1882, Dewey applied to Johns Hopkins University to pursue a doctorate. There, he studied under George S. Morris, a Hegelian who was developing a way to combine idealism and empiricism. Morris only taught at Hopkins part-time. The two other especially important instructors teaching at Hopkins were G. Stanley Hall and Charles Saunders Peirce. Hall was an early psychologist who focused on childhood development and physiology. He graduated from Harvard in 1878, earning the first doctorate in psychology under the supervision of, wait for it, William James. Hall later traveled to Europe to learn the newest methods in laboratory experimentation in psychology taking place in Germany, and to study the work of Wilhelm Wundt. Hall was the first president of the American Psychological Association. Remember, Dewey was the eighth. With Morris out of the picture temporarily, Dewey was able to develop an interest in experimentation and laboratory work that began while he was still in Vermont under the influence of Hall. Dewey resisted taking Peirce's class at first because he was skeptical of the mathematical approach to logic that Peirce was developing. He eventually did take the course, but it would take several years before Dewey would swing towards Peirce's way of thinking. He did contribute to the metaphysical club that Peirce had established at Hopkins, however. What's especially amazing is that when Morris left to teach elsewhere in the spring, Dewey was offered the chance to teach a History of Philosophy course. The amazing part is that two of his students were also registered in Peirce's course on logic, meaning that two people had both Dewey and Peirce as a teacher at the same time. Because Dewey didn't take Peirce's class, his substitute was a political economy course where one of his fellow students was Woodrow Wilson, future American president during the First World War. The two even debated the question of education funding, with Wilson arguing for states' rights and Dewey arguing for funding on the basis of social need. Dewey predicted that Wilson would go far in politics. In 
Dewey's philosophical training at Hopkins was heavily influenced by the new methods developing in Germany, with both Morris and Hall having studied there. Dewey graduated from Hopkins after defending his dissertation entitled The Psychology of Kant, which has been lost. It reflected his influences, Kantian and Hegelian thinking combined with new conclusions about the conscious and unconscious mind. In a paper written the same time entitled The New Psychology, Dewey stresses ideas which would later become prominent in his thinking. This includes the idea that minds are not merely receptive, but are part of a relation to a larger social life and environment. Dewey's career involved the development of a pragmatist approach to philosophy, and in several of his works he makes reference to the idea of reconstruction and reconstruction of philosophical thinking. This channel is called Reconstructing Philosophy. But what does reconstruction mean? The most obvious thing that comes to mind when we use a word like reconstruction is the reconstruction era. This was a period in America following the Civil War in which southern states were literally reconstructed and reintegrated into the Union with black slaves being freed, and at least in theory being afforded equal treatment under a newly revised constitution. However, Dewey uses the term reconstruction in a broader sense. J. Martin's The Education of John Dewey suggests that Dewey became attached to the term as it was used by his pastor, Louis Brastow, who advocated for spiritual reconstruction through social action. Martin notes, Brastow's emphasis on reconstruction rather than conversion planted that word in Dewey's mind. It's worth noting that reconstruction can have different meanings. Some of them can be more conservative in nature. One can reconstruct something exactly the way it was, just as one may rebuild a house that had burned down, a rebuilding. One might reconstruct a crime scene, a reenactment. On the other hand, reconstruction can suggest alteration and change, rebuilding and revising something. But what meaning does Dewey attach to reconstruction as it pertains to philosophy? To understand this, we need to consider the origins of philosophy. A common theme that runs through pragmatist thinking is the relationship between feeling and reasoning. If you take a first-year philosophy course, you will be told how much philosophers value reason, rationality, and truth in their struggle to find what the world is really like. But we know that people are not purely reasonable. We have biases, desires, and other social and cultural influences. For example, the concern for the hazards and uncertainty of our changing world is one of the most prominent social influences on philosophy. We do not like the inherent uncertainty when we act in the world, for we can never completely predict the outcome ahead of time. This sentiment leaves us seeking what is comforting, what is completely predictable. It drives us to seek absolute certainty. Early humans were no different, and the associations that gave rise to the dramatic myths and stories of early humans were less about explaining the world and more about our emotional association with the world around us. Early human civilizations were marked by a high degree of hazard and uncertainty about the world. Prior to the Bronze Age, the lack of tools and skills needed to deal with those hazards led us to grasp at anything that could establish control by looking for omens and prognosticators. This method of minimizing those hazards seeks to control the fundamental forces of reality, and it gives rise to all sorts of religions, myths, and stories about the world. For example, a comet in the sky may be taken as a bad omen for crop harvests, and thus some rite or ceremony may be conducted for some god by those who are devoted to save the crop. Eventually, these stories, myths, and associations became socially and culturally ingrained and gave rise to group traditions and practices that helped define and unify various cultures. They also structured political, economic, and social relations. Experiences gained a common understanding and gave rise to social norms and expectations. However, none of this suggests a search for truth. 
But living requires that we understand certain truths. Is this eatable? Is a predator near? Whole grain breads like whole wheat and rye are especially good for you. Humans at least sometimes need to understand facts about the world. Through the study of the natural world and the relationships between certain acts and certain consequences, humans could discover true facts about how to use nature for their own ends. Growth of these facts allowed for the creation of industry, the arts, and crafting. All of these expanded our pool of factual knowledge. This is the method of changing the world through action. But what happens when social traditions and norms come into conflict with this more factual positivistic knowledge? Dewey frequently discusses how the Greek social class structure affected their answer to this question. The beliefs which arose from the arts with their verifiable facts backed up by evidence were considered less prestigious than those based on rite and ceremony. The understanding that came with being able to craft a vase or make a pair of shoes was considered inferior, whereas understandings of, quote, occurrences so uncontrollable that they testified to the presence and operation of powers beyond the scope of everyday and mundane life, end quote, were considered superior. So these two ways of knowing became socially and culturally ingrained as they were tied to different social classes. Nevertheless, in Greek society by the time of Socrates, this positivistic knowledge had grown to such a degree of accuracy and verifiability that it became hard to ignore the conflicts between it and traditional beliefs. Old beliefs which could no longer be accepted on social or political authority alone required a more formal and specific justification. The need was to, quote, develop a method of rational investigation and proof which should place the essential elements of traditional belief upon an unshakable basis, end quote. This would secure the authority of traditional beliefs by taking them out of the field of mere habit and social custom and anchoring them instead in metaphysics. This is the tradition of Western philosophy as inherited by the Greeks. As Dewey argues, philosophy did not develop in an unbiased way from an open and unprejudiced origin. It had its task cut out for it from the start. It had to extract the essential moral kernel out of the threatened traditional beliefs of the past. It became the work of philosophy to justify on rational grounds the spirit, though not the form, of accepted beliefs and traditional customs. It should be no surprise then that in offering a rational justification for Greek social structures that Greek philosophy would take the same dim view of the arts. Greek philosophy, mirroring Greek social society, tends to emphasize what is ideal, eternal, and unchanging over things and processes of change. Things that undergo change suffer from a privation or lack of being. It is never fully one thing or another. The result, as Dewey notes, was that there was a depreciation of practice that was given a philosophical, ontological justification. To know was to know what was independent of change, and thus what is universal and ontologically independent of what we experience around us. A good example of this thinking is Plato's allegory of the cave. In the allegory, a group of people are chained to a wall and only see shadows projected on the wall from objects that are behind them. We are like the people chained to the wall, seeing only a phenomenal reality of everyday changing experience. But if we were to be taken out of the cave, we would eventually discover the actual reality that lies beyond all human experience in the world of change. Socrates tells us that knowledge is about understanding the world of forms, the unchanging, timeless, and absolute essences that make up all things. Thus, knowledge is identified with what is fixed and independent of human thinking. The common, everyday world of change presents only shadows, and thus, Knowledge of the practical art, which allows us to operate in that world, is of less importance. Greek philosophy offered itself as the sole rational guide for knowing all that is important in the world and as a guide for how we ought to conduct ourselves. The result was a split between two realms of existence. As Dewey describes it, quote, Over against this absolute noumenal reality which could be apprehended but only by the systematic discipline of philosophy itself stood the ordinary, empirical, relatively real, phenomenal world of everyday experience. It was this world that the practical affairs and utilities of men were concerned. It was this imperfect and perishing world that matter-of-fact, positivistic science referred. 
So the kinds of understanding associated with the Greek lower class was judged to be inferior to the kinds of knowing practiced by the ruling class. In other words, philosophy's obsession with what transcends experience, its search for some absolute reality that is knowable through reason, has its origins not with pure reason alone, but with Greek social and cultural influences and a desire for certainty. This basic framework of the Greeks became the tradition of Western philosophy. Later these influences would change as the development of early science demonstrated an ability and desire to control a changing world, and the early modern age brought about a renewed focus on particulars and individualism. However, Dewey suggests that despite these changes, new philosophies retain the older traditions and a desire to still secure knowledge in a metaphysical relationship. The result of this influence on philosophy has been a fixation on certainty as an ideal, and the idea that knowledge is an attempt to capture a metaphysical reality independent of human interest. As Dewey describes it, the common essence of all these theories in short is that what is known is antecedent to the mental act of observation and inquiry and is totally unaffected by these acts. The conclusions that follow from this framework include a correspondence theory of truth, the isolation of value claims from knowledge claims, the idea that knowing is simply about mirroring the world or what Dewey calls the spectator theory of knowledge, and eventually skepticism. Think about it this way. What do you mean when you claim to know something about the world? You may be tempted to think that the world just is the way it is, independent of what we think. Then we come along and create some sort of mental or linguistic copy of that world. Thus, we are only spectators to the world and the concept of knowledge is defined by this metaphysical relationship between a copy and an, the objective independent world. But this ignores the role that action and inquiry actually plays in getting at what we call knowledge. Like what problems make us want to investigate this specific thing? What kinds of questions are we asking? What investigative practices and standards are we using? How certain do we need to be in our conclusions? Knowledge for Dewey is an activity. We know the world as we interact with it. So what should be the goal of philosophy? Should we be looking for knowledge claims in the fabric of some metaphysical reality that lies beyond experience? What purpose does it serve us or society at large to know that if I claim that grass is green, such a statement is true not merely because that's what experience and investigation tells us, but because there's a metaphysical relationship to a reality that may never be confirmed through human efforts? Are we not simply following the tenets of a philosophical tradition which was established in response to social conditions which no longer hold?